This podcast from News Talk WHCU is brought to you by Brightworks Computer Consulting. Our guest this morning is a clinical professor of law and the director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. He blogs online at LegalInsurrection.com. William Jacobson joins us with today being the uh, Israel and Palestinian negotiations resuming under the watchful eye of our U.S. State Department. And prisoners released from Israeli jails yesterday returned back to the West Bank last night. William Jacobson, is there any hope of peace in the Middle East with the uh, the prisoner release of 104 Palestinian prisoners, some of them with blood on their hands? Well, last night, 26 of the 104 were released. The way it's structured is that the 104 um, who are people sentenced for crimes committed prior to the signing of the Oslo Agreements in 1993. Uh, And every single one of them has blood on his hands. Uh, In fact, every one of them committed a murder. Uh, And 26 of them were released last night uh, as a uh, goodwill gesture, I guess you'll call it, from Israel. And they were welcomed home, you know, to celebrations on the West Bank in Gaza. Uh, I don't know whether there's any hope for peace in the Middle East, you know, uh, I guess there's always hope, but I'm not sure how much the prisoner release really adds to it. Yesterday, Israel's high court rejected a petition to prevent the release of these Palestinian prisoners. The petition, which came from a group which represents terror victims, was rejected. Uh, is there, was there a case to be made for keeping these murderers behind bars? I'd imagine there would have to be, but legally speaking. You know, well, uh, yes, there's a case to be made, but it's... Uh, In the context of Israel, everything's always a little different because you have the political process and you have the, uh, you know, military process. And I think what the high court in Israel says in every one of these where there are prisoner releases is essentially that's for the political and for, uh, you know, decision. That's not really a legal decision. And yes, I mean, a lot of the families were very upset because these are not political prisoners being released. I mean, you have people who, you know, killed people with axes, um, you know, stabbed people to death. Uh, Every single one of them was sentenced to uh, multiple, or at least one or multiple life terms in prison, and they're not going to serve it. So you can imagine how even in the U.S., if your family member were killed, were murdered with an axe, and then the person were released 20 years later, you wouldn't be very happy about it either. Absolutely not. However, what does Israel get in return from the Palestinian people in exchange for these violent criminals being released back to the West Bank? Well, they actually got nothing, and in fact, that was one of the selling points uh, on the Palestinian side. That's what they said, is that they didn't have to give up anything in order to get the prisoners released. Uh, What they did agree is to resume peace talks, but so they, you know, I guess in exchange for that, they agreed to talk to the Israelis, but that, uh, you know, we'll see where that goes. I think what really was going on here is that... um, Mahmoud Abbas, the the leader of the Palestinian Authority, is a very weak political figure. And for him to have any chance, if he's even interested in it, in negotiating something serious, um, he's going to have to, you know, bolster himself domestically there, because he has Hamas, which rules Gaza Strip. Uh, He has other rivals. So I think what this really was, was Israel giving Abbas some breathing room, giving him something where he could point to people and say, look what I've accomplished, now go let let me negotiate. Whether that actually works is a different question, but I think that's the logic behind it. William Jacobson, clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School, our guest this morning. That sounds like it puts the ball squarely in the Palestinian people's court when the negotiations continue later today. Well, I think it's going to be in both. I mean, there's been a number of offers over the years from the Israelis. There's the very famous offer at Camp David with Bill Clinton, uh, where the Israelis, I think the number was offered 93 or 94 or 95 percent of the West Bank um, turned over to the Palestinian Authority, and um, Yasser Arafat walked away from it. That's been verified by people who were there. There were similar offers made by uh, Uh, Omer, the prior prime minister, um, that the Palestinians walked away from. I I think the the bigger problem is not that 
Israel is not willing to negotiate something. It's that on the Palestinian side, they have not really accept, ever accepted the existence of Israel. Hamas announced just recently that they are not bound by these negotiations. They do not recognize Israel, never will. Uh, so there's a significant portion of the uh, you know, Palestinian population that simply does not recognize Israel. And so it's not a question of whether you, you know, turn over 90% or 93% or 85%. Those, those are all just negotiating points. The real question is whether the Palestinians as a people have accepted Israel's existence, and that's what remains to be seen. On the flip side, what are the opportunities that the nation of Israel has in recognizing uh, the Palestinian people as a state? Well, I think there's a couple of things there. One, if it truly does result in peace, then, then that's a huge dividend. I mean, that's, that's what they want. They evacuated Gaza, uh, and all they got in Gaza was an Iranian missile base um, and run by Hamas. So, you know, giving up land, if it results in peace, I think the Israelis, not all of them, but the majority of them are willing to accept but giving up land, if it doesn't bring peace, only puts you in a weaker position. So I think what's going to probably have to happen is there's going to have to be some concessions by the Palestinians as to certain you know, parts of the West Bank that the Israelis feel are essential for their self-defense and their security. Uh, you know, there's this myth out there that the Israelis are illegally occupying the West Bank. Uh, that's something that we've examined at my blog, um, and that's actually historically not true, uh, but that is the current narrative. So the, the question is whether the Palestinians can get out of that narrative and can view themselves, uh, you know, historically as, as saying, you know, there's two sides to blame here and that we've got to reach a compromise. So far, that there's no indication that that's going to take place. Uh, you know, Palestinians um, have uh, said that they want absolute return to the 67 borders, which were actually never borders. They were just an armistice agreement, and that armistice agreement in 1949 said they're not going to be the final borders. Uh, but that has now become the narrative, unfortunately adopted by the U.S. to some extent, that 67 pre-67 borders somehow have some legal or meaningful you know, significance when, in fact, they were just where people stopped fighting when the Arab armies tried to destroy Israel in 1948. So there's a lot of things that people have to come to grips to. The other thing is the issue of the return of Palestinian refugees. Mm. Again, that, that's always presented in the U.S. as a one-sided issue that, you know, Palestinians were thrust out of Israel, whether for a variety of reasons, um, a lot of which had to do with the war uh, launched against Israel. But there were an equal number of uh, Jews of Arab descent who had to flee Arab lands. And those, uh, so there were about six to 700,000 Jews from Arab countries who moved to Israel as five to 600,000 uh, Arabs moved out of what became Israel. So there was essentially an exchange of populations, and that's not something that really anybody has focused on or anybody has accepted, that you can't just say it's, you know, uh, right of return. I mean, you had a war that was launched against Israel. Refugees were con uh, created on both sides of the conflict in approximately equal numbers. Israel absorbed the refugees in Israel, the Jewish refugees, the Arabs never uh, absorb the Arab re refugees, and therefore you have this problem, but, it, but it, you can't solve that problem by saying we're only going to deal with one half of the equation. The fact is that Israel exists. It has 7 million people now, 6 million of whom are Jewish, 1 million of whom are uh, not Jewish, mostly Muslim, but some Christians. Uh, and, you know, the Palestinians are just going to have to either accept that reality or it's going to just continue on the way it's gone. But I don't think they've come to the point uh, that, you know, they elected Hamas in Gaza. Uh, so I don't think it's come to the point that they've really accepted it. And that's why I don't, I'm not real hopeful that there will be a peace agreement. LegalInsurrection.com is where you'll find the thoughts and blog of our guest, William Jacobson, Clinical Professor of Law and Director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. I feel, William, that in the aftermath of the Camp David Accords, in the long term, not much changed. In the aftermath of the Oslo Accords, it feels like when it came to the relationship between Israel and the Palestinian people, not much changed. How much collateral is the U.S. spending to make these peace talks happen, and what are the expectations that anything will give? Well, you know, the Camp David Accords with Egypt have been a success as between Egypt and Israel. Uh, 
But you had you had rockets fired from the Sinai uh, just yesterday into uh, Elad. That's true, but not by not by the Egyptian military. The Egyptian military has its own problem in Sinai, which is um, that it's essentially been taken over by Hamas and Al Qaeda mm-hmm. elements, um, and they're trying to crack down now. But it, but it's, that's a problem. But that doesn't, to me, necessarily go to the issue of whether Camp David was a success. I think those were a success, but that's a collateral problem that needs to be dealt with. Oslo was not a success. I mean, what Oslo did is it reestablished the PLO, Yasser Arafat, on the West Bank, um, uh, you know, from exile in Tunisia, I think it was at the time. And that was, that was a real negative, because what it did is it took a very hostile um, group, which, you know, had developed its reputation for hijacking airplanes, uh, and so on, and supplanted the local political leadership with this outside element. And that's why we've had all these problems over the years. There, there was no indigenous uh, political element that could, uh, you know, could grow there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it, these accords have been a, a, a problem, uh, you know, but I guess you keep trying because the, the, it's better than the alternative. I think that's the bottom line. Clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. Keep up with him online at LegalInsurrection.com and look forward to speaking with you again soon. William Jacobson, thank you for the very latest this morning. Great. Take care.